Don't you love that when you're trying to remember something, it's been like 20 minutes and then all of a sudden it just pops in your head yeah. when you can't do anything about it. So I'll forget about it again. Uh, quiz in Monday. So this is what we're going to do next week, okay? So I have one more quiz. You're going to have to read chapter 16, which is a pretty short chapter on reconstruction. I am, so I'm going to, I'm going to sign in it right now, but it won't be due until Wednesday. You'll get, you'll get you back. We're not going to do a regular test. Yeah, quiz on Wednesday. Quiz on Monday and quiz on Wednesday. That is lovely. Yes. It's just remind me. Remind me after this. It'll be another like 12 questions. Now we're gonna to have to have a test the week after we get back. I uh, will give you the review list. I'll post it early. We'll get it. It'll just be do multiple choice and like two short answers. Yeah, a relatively short one, but we have we have to have one. Oh, and when do you want the review list for the final? Yeah. Right How about Monday? I'll try to get it done out of Monday. It's all short. Oh, 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 oh. See, so now 20 doesn't seem so bad, does it? Oh, I'll, I'll, you guys only have to do 20. You see, doesn't 20 sound better when you originally thought 58? You see, that's how you... Twenty. I'm being, I'm being very serious. 20. You're going to get four rows. You're going to get four columns. You have to pick five from each column. 20. Oh, I'll tell you. I will, yeah, I will give you the list. I'll tell you. And then, and then the week the week before, I'll narrow it down. Yes, it's a lot of writing, but you got to write what you know. And also, you're going to have to be in a situation where you're going to have to write for an hour and 20 minutes. You just have to do it. So we're going to do it. It's a, I think it's the best way to test. It's writing, it's essay, you got to root, it's more than just simply multiple choice. And I know it's a lot of work, but at the same time, you got to write what you know. And it's it's more in depth. Yeah. About a third of your total score. Great. So what I do is, but don't, don't think, I don't do like a third, third, third. What I do is I take the total points, then I extrapolate to make it work So I do the math and make it. And so it's enough, it's definitely enough to move your grade up one or two points. Um, easily. I mean, like if, if so, like if you're still like an 80 page or something, you can do very well on the that kind of thing. It's not enough, let's say you're sitting at an 80 or you're sitting at a 90, 95, and you get a, if you, you'd have to get like a zero disruption delivery. Right? Yeah, that's right. Drop your grade. Just to see what happens. <laughs> All right, let's go and finish up 864 Hank for 20. Oh, really Yes, there are 20. I'm going to have four columns of terms. And you're going to have to pick five from each column. Yes, it's going to be right. Oh, and it all has to be this week. You know, I've been talking crayon. Let's do a crayon, right? Crayon, cool. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to have to answer once more earlier and then a little bit later. And that full column will be the bulk of those will be what we did the last two weeks. So be, that'll be relatively fresh. Yeah, that's why I do it to make sure you do answer some from. It, it's a. It, I think it's a great way to do a great way to do a test. And, oh, that, could that be the final one said? Yeah. I'll talk to my people. Yeah. All right, so where do we finish? We get to here, do we get to the valley? We got to the valley? Yeah. Oh, I should add. Lincoln, Lincoln said we're fighting this horrible civil war. We got to here, didn't we? The, we got right here? All right, so Lincoln said we're fighting this horrible civil war. Yeah. My heart was beating right there. The rug was out of whack. Yes. <laughs> it's virtually like nothing else except for the rug. Everything else that I'm going to do. Rug, that's got to be there. 
I sleep at night. That and I'm comforted by arrows. Moving on. Yeah, arrows. Maps with arrows. Comforted. I sleep all night. Like, like a bow and arrows. There's no, there's a terrible way that would be. Okay, moving on. I'm thinking about arrows. Oh, before we get started, it's sunny. It's been like a whole week since I've seen the sun. You know what that means? All the monkeys will come back. Soon those trees will be filled to the brim with the holler monkeys. Haven't you noticed them out there? You want to hear my holler monkey story? So uh, my wife and I went to Costa Rica. Oh, that's also we saw the uh, one spot in Costa Rica. We saw about, I'm not exaggerating, over 100 turkey vultures in one very, very small spot. It's disconcerting seeing that many turkey vultures. Have you been around turkey vultures? They're actually pretty cool when they're flying. Well, okay, maybe not. <laughs> they may know something. But we're walking on this tree and you ready for the. I'm walking along, heard this noise up there, and looked up, and all, and have you ever seen a howler monkey? They're big, black. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm walking along, and I look, and I just, there's a black lab in a tree. <laughs> they look exactly like a black <laughs> And this on the arm, and I'm like, that's a black lab. And the monkey does not go, and then they throw their stuff at you. But moving on. <laughs> that's a little disconcerting, too. Here's another note. Uh, Back to the important stuff. At the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln laid out the reason for the war. It was to preserve what type of union? Yes. Yeah, based upon equality. And Rick looked back, and if we don't have that kind of union based upon equality, what have we done? Yeah, let everybody down from the founding fathers on. And why did he choose the Declaration of Independence? Yeah. Because that was um, his document and respect by the and it's our document. The South, we're the ones, the true descendants. I think it's very clever. And you know, the, the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, really this whole series of compromises by people just kind of throwing things out there. But it became very important. So we got me. Oh, what did the Union have to do? They had to win the war, before, or at least make it appear like they won the war before what big event? Election. Yeah, the election of 1864. And what did the South have to do? They had to do what? Yeah, hold out. And, you know, the Morrell Act created those land grant colleges. What's the land grant college in Montana? Yeah, Montana State. We talked about a little bit Transcontinental Railroad. We'll come back to those. But after the break, we'll finish up any New South stuff and go from there. So we have wilderness. Do we, do we get to almost breaking through? Awful battle. Did I tell you about the forest catching fire? Oh, and there are wounded men in the forest. Yeah. Yeah, that's a drawing of this and then trying to evacuate them. Men talked about the wilderness for the rest of their life. How horrible that was. In this confusing battle when it ended, once again, this just to give you an idea. We're talking 29,000 more casualties. Aren't these numbers just getting shocking? 29, eight, uh, about 18 and a half thousand of them were Union. You don't need to know the numbers, but it looked like another Confederate victory. And after all these battles, you know, it's a battle, then they go back to camp and they wait. <laughs> Sometimes a new general, then another battle. And so when Union forces begin to pull back, when they their advance was cut off after this bloody battle, the first corps was a sixth corps, a general by the name of Sedgwick. And they were pulling back at the night of the sixth. And they got to this road right here. It's a Germana Plank Road and down to the Orange, the Orange Turnpike. And they got to this crossroad. And all the men assume they're going to turn north, go back into camp, fight again in three months. But they also knew if they turn, they get to this crossroad and they turn right, meaning going south, they know what's going to happen in the next one or two days. If they go south again, what's going to happen? Another battle right away, maybe worse than the wilderness. So when Sedgwick's Corps got there, they all knew it. And you can imagine a lot of the Union soldiers were grumbling. You know, now Grant's an overall command, we still can. But when they got to this crossroad, there was somebody from General Meade's staff standing there. It's pitch black. So they just a couple of torches as they marched that night. And when they got there, by torchlight, the staff officer got there and pointed south. And they all knew. 
put that in. They're reborn. And how do they react? Not quite. They started cheering, huzzah, hurrah. And they had to run down the line to tell them to shut up. They all knew they'll fight the next day, but they also knew they'll end this thing. They're going to fight it and end it. And they knew Grant made the order for me. And that would forever change your attitude towards Grant. He wasn't like McClellan who got all the cheers. Meade wasn't either. But they're going to end the war and return this. That is a big moment. And isn't that weird thing? Yeah, they know they're going to go down. They know it. And we're coming to a big concept that's important in defense in every war. This will be important in this war. This is how Germany and to a lesser degree, Austria, Hungary, how about, how about World War I against basically the world? This is how Germany and Japan held out so long in World War II. These are a crucial element for defense, and it's called interior lines or interior lines of the communication. So I have to draw it for you. I'm going to have to draw you a map of the Confederacy. Now, I know you're saying, how, you know, once again, here is Partridge showing off his cartography skills. I know it. I can't help it, right? Do you want me to quick draw the Confederacy really quick? So this is it's quick, but it's still pretty accurate to scale. There's the Confederacy, right? There's it, perfect. Here's Richmond. I don't know, wow, it's right. No formal training. Yes. Well, I've actually I've been to Richmond, but but it's just natural. I was born with this innate skill of knowing where Richmond was. <laughs> so here's Washington, D.C. So just imagine the attack. So we'll do. Here's the Union forces advance. Oops. The Confederates advance. Battle. It's a draw like the wilderness. No clear winner. And so the Union Army decides, OK, we're going to try to outflank them. So we're going to try to get here to the next crossroads town where there's a road to get there. So now it's a race to get there first. Union forces have to back up a little bit, don't they? And then come. But what Confederate forces? Straight line. Interior lines give a huge advantage to those on the defense because they have a shorter distance to go. This is huge. This this. This, along with the fact that armies on the offense have, offensive have to come out in the open and attack, is the reason why defensive armies have an advantage, and you can have a lot fewer men. And they can move men a lot easier. And there's something else. Let's say that we do this a couple times. So they go here and then here. What happens to the supply lines for the north, for the blue? Doesn't it get longer and longer? While this supply line gets shorter, armies on the offensive because of interior lines also have longer supply lines. And so it's a lot more men, you have to protect the lines. This is how armies, smaller armies can survive so long. And we can see this in every war. We see this right now in Ukraine with Russia. Russia has really long supply lines and Ukraine much shorter. And it's given them an advantage even though there's a lot more Russian soldiers. It just it gives you advantages on the defensive. And so here's the race. But this is a lot more, um, there's a lot more rivers and the forest extends here. So they gotta go this way. The next crossroad town is right here in Spotsylvania and it's a race. Union forces are marching. Lee, just knowing, beats him there by 12 hours. And they immediately do what? Dig, dig trenches. And so the next battle will be Spotsylvania. Oh, supply lines, as I said before, supply lines advantage to the defense. The Battle of Spotsylvania is going to be a very long battle, 11, 12, 13, as me and me try to figure out a way to get around the Confederate lines. Here's an uh, engraving of it showing parts of the battle. And here's a map of it. Oh. To give you an idea how bloody this battle is going to be, here's a story to show you how awful it's going to be. So General said, the Sixth Corps, the same Corps that the men all cheer. When he, he and his staff were the first Corps to arrive at Spotsylvania and Confederates were there, and there were maybe three quarters, half a mile, three quarters of a mile away from Confederates, and Confederate snipers using rifled muskets were taking pot shots at them. Now, 
at that distance, first off, with a black powder musket, if you're going to aim a mile, how would you hold your musket? Yeah, <laughs> like, a, like it's a howitzer, kind of lob the shells. Modern smokeless powder, which is going to come about 30 years after the war, in mass scale, you know, a bullet can go a mile. I'm not saying you hit, but it can go a mile pretty easily. But here, they're shooting like this. So they're not really aiming, they're just taking pot shots. And so Sedgwick, incredibly brilliant. The men loved him. He, he was someone who made sure they had good food, good campsites, etc. They called him Uncle John. I was seen as a big comic. He wasn't like a brilliant commander, but he took him. His men adored him. And when he first rode up, he, he was incredibly brilliant. He's riding up, watching his staff officers who are ducking and hiding as these shots are kind of hitting the dirt around, just a few shots. Sedgwick looks at him, kind of in disgust. Said, man, quit scrambling, quit running around. They couldn't hit an elephant at this disc. That is just a precursor to how horrible this battle is going to be. And so, Spotsylvania. This is Sedgwick right there. So, the Confederate line went kind of like this, made a turn along the road right here. This is called the angle. And me, they try to find, you know, maybe attack here, try to find the probe, these areas. You know, they're still hoping they could somehow break through and get to this crossroads, move a lot faster along the roads here, instead of trying to go around like this again. And so, trying to find a spot. Right here, the forest and the hills were only about 50 yards away from the Confederate trenches. And boy, the Confederates got good at digging trenches. They realized you dig, you're rough, you have a chance to live. And so they dug about a three or four foot trench. The trench line is still there. You go to this battlefield, you can walk all along this. They dug a hole, mounted the dirt, and then they sent men to go cut down trees and stack the logs to give it even a better, they call it a breastwork. Pretty formidable line. So they're probing along, and this part of the forest was only about 50 yards away. And they tried to attack on the 10th, it failed. On the 11th, a major from New York, I have a prominent family in New York named Emily, came up with a plan. I got to show you the plan because it's a good story. Did look at the map? I don't know if I could recreate that. <laughs> that was pretty, I should have, I should have taken a picture. So imagine, here's the Confederate line. Pretty good line, huh? Feel like there. So the plan had always been, they're still attacking the same way they've done in the past. Line up their regiments, march, stand, and shoot. And the casualties were appalling. Upton had an idea. Since they're all muzzle loaders, they can only fire three rounds every minute. What if we do this? If the forest is 50 yards away, we do the exact opposite. He takes his regiment of 400 men and lines them up in two lines like this, perpendicular to the Confederate lines. He orders them, don't load your musket. Don't stop and fire. Fix bayonets and charge. With the idea being, we come out of the woods, no preliminary bombardment, nothing. Just a quick bugle call, stand up and run full speed to the Confederate line. They can fire maybe one round. How fast can you run 50 yards? You know, I can do it in about four seconds, but other people. No. Carrying equipment, you know what? Over drop down, seven, eight seconds. Realistically, get here and then clear out the trench line this way and then let units come. Fine. Just take them totally by surprise. It's actually a pretty good plan. And so, let's try it. They're called commanders general by name of Warren. Let's do it. And so, they got, they lined up, they fixed bayonets. First thing, they had to find two what? Crazy volunteers to lead it. Think about two guys in front going, <laughs> screaming at the Confederates, and every Confederate gun will, will be aimed at those two men. The amazing thing, thing is, there's always two. There's always somebody. I'll do it. Anyone in here? Yeah, let me do it. <laughs> they found a couple guys. And then also think about it, they stand up and they all charge full speed like this. Like, don't trip. 
because then like, ooh, I could roll dominoes. But they all stood up, blew the bugle, they came out of the forest screaming like maniacs, full speed. The amazing thing is those first three guys, they weren't hit. They were so taken by surprise, they shot around and missed. They got to the trench line and cleared 100 feet like that. It worked perfectly, but nobody thought it would work, so nobody was there to exploit the breakthrough. It failed, but now it got back to me. And Mead said, what if we do it with 4,000? And so now General Upton, he got promoted, is going to lead a brigade. And they're going to have four lines of 1,000 men each. And they're going to attack right here at this angle, pierce through here. And then 12,000 men under General Hancock, the same Corps commander who was wounded at Cemetery Ridge and at the Battle of Gettysburg, he's back, but he's not 100%. He would lead his men and exploit that breakthrough. So four lines. They'll clear it out and go into the middle. Pretty good plan. It's about 100 yards this time, so a lot more dangerous. Same thing happened. The first four guys in each of the four lines of 1,000 men each, they weren't hit. How were they not hit? But same deal. They did it on noon of the 12th. And I've been there. You can walk there. You walk the trench line. You can go stand exactly where it was. And you can see it's a long ways, you know, 100 yards, pretty long, especially when people are shooting at you. But it's not like Gettysburg or Fredericksburg. And they stood up, they charged, and it worked again. They cleared it out. Men poured in the Confederate rear. Thousands of Confederate soldiers ran. It looked like this was it. This was the breakthrough. But Hancock's Corps got lost. There are mountains back there, the low mountains, forests. They could hear shooting. They just marched in circles. They couldn't find it for over an hour. And by the time they arrived, Confederates, personally led by Lee himself, pushed Upton's men back. And now the fight is going to rage right here for the next 20 hours along that mound of dirt and logs. And some of the most horrific fighting of the entire Civil War. It's going to be called the bloody end. Back and forth, the fighting raged for hours. And then it started to rain and rain hard. So after a few hours of charging over the top, it devolved to us, became night. As men were cramming up along this, you see these logs right here? Along this, and just fighting over this. And they would like shoot in the people's face, and like slam or slash their bayonet. The men in front would just kind of hand the rifle back and drop it. Someone else hand him a loaded musket and fire and slash. Dead men fell right there. Wounded men would fall and then would drown in the mud as other men pressed against them. Thousands would fight along this bloody angle. It was so horrible. And this is all muskets, all musket balls with black powder. On that spot was a 22 inch oak tree. And it was cut in two by just bullets. And oak is hard wood, cut in half, and fell on the battlefield. By the end of that 20 hours, the Confederates pulled back and dug new trenches, and the Union was left with this literally just grave. In one 300 foot spot, 300 foot of the trench, there were 500 bodies. Just mounds of flesh. If it could do that to a tree, think of what bullets would do to humans. And so that is why there are in one tomb at Arlington National Cemetery, one tomb of over 11,000 unknown Union soldiers. No idea who they are. Just bodies. They couldn't identify them. Here's the tree eventually. And this is. This is at, at uh, Smithsonian Museum of American History, right near Sheridan's Forest, Winchester. And that's the tree. It's cut down. And if you look here, you see these little gray specks. Those are mini balls, musket balls. You can still see them. And so the first time I went and saw this, it was 97, first time I was there. And I took a picture of it. The problem was then, you know, that's pre digital camera. They were kind of experimental. So I had a 35 millimeter camera, took a picture. A little dark side of flash. Now, if you ever use a flash inside on a glass case, you can't shoot directly at it. 
because then you just get your reflection and a big light. So you have to get that kind of an angle. The problem is with a 35 millimeter camera, you have no idea do you get the film developed. You guys have never, I know you've seen a lot of you've seen these cameras, but you see digital cameras. So now I take a picture. Oh, I don't like that. Take another one. So I took the picture and I thought I'll let the right angle and still see it. And so I got the, the film developed and the picture was a flash and the reflection of me taking a picture of a flash of a reflection of me taking a picture of a flash of a reflection of me. So the second time I went, that's the picture I took. And this is it. It's been up on, I just leave it up here. You know, I put in a little part. It's been a while. But you can see it right here. If you look closely, you can still see the mini balls stuck in. I do have some mini balls from the Vicksburg battle for lots of films. And Monday, take, let's take a look at them. I promise they're lead. I mean, I just might just look at them. You're not young. Not young. Two or three year olds, you don't want to give them lead. Any age lens really bad. As those two are in my special topics class, we all know that uh, uh, I have about 20 or 30 times more lead in my system than you do. <laughs> Why? Remember? Why? I'm going to be gone that day. Do you remember? Oh, you don't know? I remember at least like five. It wasn't paint. So, like. But these, back these put lead in, lead in gas. Oh, yes. Lead in gasoline. And so they got rid of lead in gasoline was banned by the U.S. government in 1986. These put lead in gasoline because engine's not. Um, that makes you more violent, irrational. Be very careful, Rock. Yes. Huh? Go. Did you stop bringing a bottle of water? For, for the for the tip, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, at the end of the day, after this battle, it did not break through, and there's going to be another thirty thousand men down, but twelve thousand you. Another horrible battle, and now there's losing so many men. But think about the Confederates. We're now talking 20, over 23,000 Confederates killed, wounded, or missing in a week. In a week, they're going to scrape every man they can find. Now, the next place they raise, you don't have to write this one down, small battle here at Hanover Junction. That failed, and so the next one, by interior lines, they're racing to Red, Cold Harbor. And... These forces would beat Grants and Meads by six hours, but they dug elaborate trenches at Cold Harbor. But Mead and Grant looked at the numbers and they decided, let's attack Cold Harbor. They dug trenches. They, there was a split rail fence. They stacked logs and dirt along it. So it was a perfect defense line. And there's another mile clearing in front of it. So here's that defense line. So it sounds a lot like Gettysburg or Fredericksburg. And the Confederates are behind this, and they shouldn't have attacked them. But both Meade and Grant, they got reinforcements. They could see the numbers, and they thought, you know, one concerted push. We break through. We're in Richmond. And so they decided with these fresh soldiers and veterans from all the battles before, they would attack over a mile-long clearing at noon on June 1st. And this time, even though they thought Upton's plan was good, it's too far away to run that way. So they lined up in those straight lines and just marched out. The thought was they would overrun. And they didn't want the slaughter again. So the first men, men in the first regiments, were, um, certain men were going to hold a 15-foot-long pole with the green flag. And the thought was, if they did break through, they would wave the flag above the smoke, Meade's off, staff officers would see it, and then they'd send reinforcements. If they don't see the flag, they pull them back and avoid the bloodshed of Frederick. That was the plan. But you can imagine how the men felt that night before they left. They knew what was going to happen. Either they saw the bodies at Spotsylvania or they knew. They heard. Now, do you know what a dog head is? 
that would become that's mandatory in World War II. They started them not quite mandatory in World War I, but something to identify the bodies that they're just destroyed by fighting. Teams. And other armies did that too in by World War I, but Civil War, some did make the, their own metal pegs or their family did, but most of them didn't have anything like that. And so they would take all these men in the first division, or first divisions of Baldy Smith's school. He was nicknamed Baldy. He's one of those unfortunate people who went bald in this fifteen. Or fortunate, depending on your point of view. But it can happen. I'm just warning you. I was about 12. This is a lay test statement. But <laughs> so I'm not sure I use staple paint on. We'll just go with that. Act like that made sense. They wrote on this piece of paper for name, your unit, your hometown, and some of the Put in the back of your because they knew what was going on. So when they called out to march and marched out a full mile, and the same thing happened. They got to a half mile, cannon opened up with shot and explosive shells, and the cannon stood in the muskets. At a couple spots, they got to about 15 yards and just men were mowed down. And they couldn't get to the, the Confederate lines, they just couldn't go there. But the whole battlefield was still small. It failed miserably. In 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 6,000 Union soldiers were dead. This is pre high explosives. There's not machine guns, there's not heavy artillery. These are still black powder muskets. What a bloodbath. But someone on Meade's staff said, I see the flags. And so they sent them on it. He wanted to be the first one to say, I saw the flies. He was lying. He just wanted the credit. Eventually, 12,000 men would go down in the Boxford Yards. Almost no Confederates. Another horrible disaster. Cold Harbor, and that's another one. If you go there, they got the line. They got most of the clearing. It was like, insane. That's suicide. So these men were letter writers and diary writers. They were all very carefully wrote in a diary. And after a couple of days, when they finally could come out and clear the bodies out there, you can just imagine what it was like after two hours. On the bodies, on the body of one of the men, the first divisions to attack, they found his diary. The diary said June 1st, 1864. Today I died. You know. So with that, well, that was. A horrible battle. They're right here. They're right at the gates of Richmond. And they still haven't won. But there's something that they all knew. Grant knew it. That's why they attacked him. They're running out of men. And the North is going to have to accept. Reluctantly. That this is going to become a war of attrition. And attrition is the horrible way that all wars are fought. This is how the United States won the Revolutionary War. This is every war ever since. And attrition means you kill, wound, maim so many of the enemy they can no longer fight. They just run out of men. In fact, they would say things like you bleed them to fight. They run out of men. They can't fight anymore. And you could go on the wide scale of you're running out of supplies, running out of food, running out of industry. But just they, you kill so many men. And so even though the Confederates only lost 2,000 men through disease and other battles, they had lost over 35,000 units. These started with just under 65,000. Yes, they got reinforcements, but they're scraping men from every single spot, pulling them from other places. They're running out of men. Eventually, the South has got to lose. And this is the way the war is going to end. But the election is coming. Both parties are going to have the nominating convention in Congress. They're running out of time. So Lee's reluctantly going to have to accept this. But I repeat, every war is won in this war. They all think it's going to be a big battle. That virtually never happens. It'll be another Napoleonic victory of moving his armies around. No, it's just killing. It's cold. It's not romantic battles. World War I was 20 million people being slaughtered from the Shulman World War II, 60 to 100 million. We don't know how many people died in China. The Soviet Union, we're not sure. Because so many died and so many. Why? 
with the way he's dead. Stop that. That's why the United States lost in Vietnam. That's why the United States would lose in Iraq and Afghanistan. We leave because finally we'd lose so many, it just wasn't worth it. We're done. And that's what it is right now in Ukraine, a horrific war of attrition. But this is a great photo. This is right after Park Cold Harbor, and they pulled the pews out of the church. You see that? And these are Grant's staff. And that's Grant. And he's leaning over. It's hard to see, but this in front of like a double hat. It's General Meade. And they're pointing at a map. Grant has one more idea. If you can't win the big victory, maybe we can hasten attrition, a.k.a. starve. They can attack here. We will come down dig trenches like they have before, but send the bulk of the army around and take Petersburg. It was an important rail junction. They take this. The Confederates will run out of supplies if they have one rickety rail line that uh, was different gauge or figure out to move supplies, and they'll starve them. Hasten the effort. It's a good plan, and it almost worked. They put them here. We came here. They had they stole nearly a day's march. They got to the James River, a really wide river. They built an incredibly long pontoon bridge over it. That's the pontoon bridge. You notice they put dirt over the bridge. That's so the horses can't see through the planks and walk through. I have wondered about that. They put straw and dirt over it. And so this is the time that I tell you about Xerxes. I know what you're thinking. What about Xerxes the Great? You're right. What about Xerxes the Great when he attacked the Greek city states? And 411 BC, right? Who's with me? Who's thinking the same thing? Not 411, 407. 411, that's the Peloponnesian War. No, there's lots of wars. We're human. So he would build, not he, he would have his engineers of the Persian Empire build a mile long pontoon bridge over the Dardanelles. That's in, it's now in Turkey between European and Asian Turkey. With a water that strait that runs between the Mediterranean and Black Sea, a mile long pontoon bridge to take his army of over 30,000 Persians to destroy Africans. But just as the bridge was built, a storm came through and blew and destroyed the bridge. Xerxes was furious. So, of course, ordered his engineers to build a new bridge and was going to have them executed. But then he realized it wasn't their fault, it was the ocean. And so he had nearly 10,000 men wade right, out into the ocean and flog it. <laughs> so they took whips and they beat the ocean. Did it work? <laughs> yes. The next pontoon bridge survived. And so, I don't know why more people don't do that. A big storm's <laughs> coming, go beat the ocean. <laughs> it's so, that's science. So with that, yeah, but then they boost to the Greeks. At the Battle of Salamis, right? You're all thinking it, right? So they crossed and it almost worked. The first corps started marching on Petersburg. Lee was fooled. Meade was back at the bridge, pushing men across. It orders attack Petersburg now. But when those first corps arrived at Petersburg, they saw these defensive lines elaborate trenches, dug, palisades. They saw this elaborate place also in front. Were all these that cost you all the free. And I wrote that down. You don't even know it. I just forgot it. So I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. The French start doing these with pointed sticks and logs, and you put these out down. This might shock you. But men, in fact, I would argue any living creature, they don't like to be impaled on sticks. So you're not going to go, ah, ah. no. What would they do if you're charging now? What would you do? Ooh. And so you put a bunch of things like those here, you put a bunch here, and you funnel the attack in one spot. Does that make sense? Then what do you line up in front of there? Cannon with cannons. In World War One, they used the newly invented barbed wire machine. Same kind of thing, they still do it today. So it was the same core that attacked the Cold Harbor, Baldy Smith's Corps. And he, when he got there, you know what he thought? Another Cold Harbor, I need reinforcements. He waited a full half a day. When Meade got there, Meade was furious and ordered him to attack. But guess who arrived in the slaughterhouse? About 30,000 of these men. And it was a slaughter. Another golden opportunity lost. 
And that would devolve in both exhausted armies dug trenches and evolved into the siege of Petersburg. The Union Army wasn't big enough to totally surround it, but the Confederates couldn't drive them out. Union would try to slowly advance and cut off the rail lines. But this siege would last from June of 1864 to April of 1865. Both sides dug in in trenches and fought it out. Soon the trench line would go all the way from Richmond to Petersburg. Unions dug trench between them. They couldn't break through the trench lines. Both sides dug in elaborate ramparts for cannon. Both sides had cupolas built up with steel uh, plates with firing holes for snipers. They would do raids across in between the two trenches. In fact, if you were caught in between the trenches, and we had sun up alone, you're dead. Those snipers would pick you off. In fact, they would give a name for those for that area between the trenches of like Petersburg. No man's land. Now, some of you might be. Some of you might refer to that big World War I, but they started calling it a Petersburg. And it devolved into hell. Incredibly hot Virginia summer, or think about when the winter hit, when it would rain, the trenches would flood. Their latrines or the bathrooms they would dig would flood. There's bodies, horses, humans, bodies everywhere. They just tried to make do. Here are some Confederate soldiers, and both sides did these. They were bored and they had to stay in the trench. They couldn't stick their head up. They stick their head up, a sniper is going to shoot them. And so we started playing this game. This is a picture of it. They did this in World War I, too. Put a hat on a bayonet, stick it up, and then bet how many musket holes would be in that hat by the uh, about 10 minutes, or I'm sorry, 30 seconds, things like that. Kind of a macabre game. Hell on earth. And stale. Remember, they had to make it look like they're winning by the election. It's getting close. It's all going into July. And um, they had to make it look like they're going to win. The Union Army had lost now 70,000 men in the battles. It's called the Overland Campaign. One. They're out of food for the Confederates. They're nearly out of men, but they're still fighting. Well, if you can't go over the top, this is as old as warfare. Let's go under. Some men from Pennsylvania, hard rock miners, they went to the regimental commander and eventually went all the way to their corps commander. And yes, it was Ambrose Burnside. The same one I know all of you are still thinking about those wonderful Burnsides. And they went to him and they said, let's take a tunnel underneath. They tried this at Vicksburg too. Dig a tunnel between the Union and Confederate lines under no man's land. And they've got to figure out a way to get air. They come up with like a pump system to get air. And then we go 50 feet in either direction, roll a bunch of gunpowder, light it off, and attack right there. It's a pretty good idea, isn't it? And so here's Union soldiers dug, digging in out. their spies everywhere, so they had to do it in top secret. They, they would pull out the dirt at night. Here, then eventually they would start rolling in gunpowder. And it worked better than anyone thought. In fact, at first, Burnside's like, Give them something to do, go dig. After about two weeks of digging, like, this might work. And they figured out through geometry when they're under the trench, they start rolling the gunpowder. Burnside went to Meade. Meade was overjoyed. Let's do it. And in fact, they just had 4,000 fresh troops under a general by the name of Carraro, who was a leader of the leader of the abolitionist movement. These were colored regiments. They called them colored soldiers then. And they were geared up. They wanted to fight and prove they could go. And so the plan was every day in the morning, both sides, well, especially the Union forces, they had more gunpowder. Union forces would shell at sun Confederate lines. And then they'd take a break. Both sides would come out into the open, in the trenches, but they would light their campfires and cook breakfast. And then they'd go back. So they wouldn't shell them while they're cooking breakfast, right? So when do you like the mine? And so the plan was for ours men would in the middle of the night would fall in the no man's land and lay. Wait until the bomb went off. And the thought was it'd be a muffled explosion and the shock waves would concuss the Confederates when they charge right through. But at the last moment, he pulled out Ferraro's division 
and replaced it with a division that had been fighting the whole time of white soldiers under a general named Liebling. Now, a lot of people said that Meade did that because of racist ideals that black soldiers do not fight. That's not true. There was a myth going around, and it's a myth, that the Union was purposely trying to slaughter black soldiers to make the United States a white republic. So Meade pulled it out in case it was a slaughter. No one told Liebling about the bond, the mine at all. Yes. And so we would be considered racist if you sent the black soldiers on the court. Yeah, it was a lose lose for him, wasn't it? So he made the absolute wrong choice. Those men thought it'd be a slaughter. In fact, Weebly was so convinced it'd be a slaughter, he sat in what they called the bomb proof that whole night and proceeded to drink as much whiskey as a human would drink. So they didn't have a commander. And so sun came out, preliminary bombardment, and then campfires, you know, sorry for the breakfast. And then they expected a muffled explosion. Well, they have about 150 foot long fuse. They lit it behind the Union line. And you, have, you can imagine what's going to happen. The fuse is going about halfway. And what's going to happen? We know it's like a bad movie. What? And so they had to find a very fast and relatively short volunteer. And the sergeant did to light it, and take off running. And it was a race. So we got just to the exit and it went off. It was not a muffled explosion. The entire Confederate line blew up. The whole thing, just a massive boom. In fact, a jet of flame went outside of the tunnel, shot that man almost 100 feet. Supposedly, he was perfectly fine. Bodies, pieces of wood, everything started flying. No one had any idea. It just kind of falling on him. There was a Confederate unit. They were having a slave cook their breakfast. Boom, they're gone. A quarter mile away, behind the line are Union forces sitting around a campfire, and they exploded. All these things are, oh, no, and it just shot them. You can imagine, wood, dirt, body parts, metal. And then they saw something very big coming at them, getting closer and closer and closer. And their story is, landing right in the middle of them, was that man. <laughs> and he stood, he's like, wow. Ah. Supposedly, they charged the dime to come see the flying man. <laughs> I will finish the story on Monday. Turning the camera off. Thank you.